every day is different. Every day I get to, yeah, so I might start the day with a, a, a call to, to, the, to the US or in, I might do the middle of the day in Southeast Asia and at the end of the day I'm connecting with Europe or I, I might get to meet with some of our alumni or I get to have an opportunity to meet with industry partners to look at a, a new program or, or a new opportunity. I get to be involved in strategy for a university that is is massive in terms of it's it's the opportunities that it provides for students and and the research activity that we do. So it's hard not to smile because you get to do all of that. And it's one of those things where it's like always pinch me because I can't believe that this is my life. I can't believe that this is my job. Sometimes I think I shouldn't tell anybody too much about it because everybody will want it because it really is the best job in the world, but that's okay. G'day and welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. I'm Rob Malicki. I'm Marin Hodman. And we are coming to you today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. Our guest today is Dr. Jessica Gallagher, who is at the University of Adelaide and is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of External Engagement, a very awesome person in international education. Jess, amazing to have you with us today on Global Horizons. much thanks for the opportunity and I guess I'll also just take the opportunity to acknowledge that I am um, joining the conversation from Ghana country which is certainly a beautiful part of our nation so thrilled to have an opportunity to speak with you. Fantastic you've had your own international study experience but we understand it was a little bit unconventional. Yeah no it, it was so I, I started university quite young so I wasn't even 17 when I started university and after my first year of study I decided that i university just wasn't the right place for me, uh, which my family finds extremely amusing now considering I've built my career around higher education. But at the time, at the ripe old age of 17, I decided that you know university was a bore and I wasn't the right fit for it. And I had met um, some people from Germany and I had studied German at high school and uh, studied, if you want to describe it that way, in the first year of university, although my grades were appalling. Um, and so I thought, no, if I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm just going to jump straight in. And so I took the summer and saved money. And then I went and moved to Germany where I had planned to work as a nanny for six months before working out what I would do with the rest of my life. But I, I fell in love with the place so much. I, I absolutely loved the opportunity to really have that immersive language experience and get to know the, the culture and the people and I loved it so much that I decided that I wanted to stay. And so I wasn't, it was, it shows my age, but it was when exchange programs just weren't as easy to access or I didn't know how to access them. And I thought, well, I don't need to, I'll just do it myself. And so I came back because I had to sit a, a language proficiency test and then I enrolled myself. And so I studied in Giesen, which was a university town in the middle of Germany, and I was there for a couple of years um, until I realised that completing your degree in Germany was going to take a long time because <laughs> that was before they went through the reforms and it just took ages uh, even to get a bachelor's degree or equivalent. And so I decided that I needed to come back to Australia and kind of grow up and get a, get a move on, which again is quite funny because even when I came back, every opportunity that I had, I went back um, to Germany. So I was fortunate to pick up a couple of scholarships through sort of German scholarship programs, the DAAD. And then when I did my PhD, it had a very German focus. And so I got to spend time as a visiting research scholar at the Free University of Berlin. But I do think that that, and I probably, I mean, it is the reason I'm in international education today, without question. And I think when you talk to a lot of people in the sector, it's because of these personal experiences that they've had and how much that international experience really transformed my view of the world, my view of myself and my capabilities, but also what I wanted to do around finding the divide, bridging the cultures. And it was through my time in Germany where I, I grew a real fascination for multiculturalism and why it worked in some locations and why it didn't in others. How, how do you feel the, the Australian unions are uh, handling their relationship with getting international students into Australia and what the focus is at the moment post-COVID. What, what's your take on it? I think we're so thrilled to have our international students back. I reflect on conversations that I had with my Vice-Chancellor at the end of 2021 where we were thinking about how long it was going to take 
to recover. So based on how poorly we had treated our international students in 2020, how long it would take for that sort of demand to return. And I think that we were all really pleasantly surprised uh, at how quickly, well, firstly, that our international students stuck with us and they remained studying online. And that provided huge opportunities for the universities to really think about what their digital offerings could look like and how we could engage more with the sort of digital environment to enhance our student experience. I mean, there was necessity, obviously, but through that has definitely um, come innovation. But we were so pleased that they stuck with us and then that, that they have been so keen to return. And we've also seen amazing diversity over the past sort of since obviously the borders uh, opened up. So here at the University of Adelaide, I mean, we still have really strong numbers of students coming from North Asia, China in particular. But what's been amazing is to see the growth of students from India, from Sri Lanka, from Bangladesh, but also from Southeast Asia. So it's Vietnam and, and growing interest in the Philippines. And, and I think that that is just wonderful for our campuses. The richness that international students bring to the classroom and campuses, I know that everybody that will be joining this podcast will already be a convert to that, but it has been absolutely fantastic just the energy um, and life that they bring back to the campus. I mean, having all of our students back makes a massive difference. But, uh, yeah, it is, it's incredible. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled and, of course, a big focus for me is how we continue to ensure that we're able to deliver a fantastic education um, and student experience so that we continue to attract those students because they're they're just so valuable. And and I'm curious, do you feel like at the same time that the universities, I guess, have well recovered in terms of having international students come back in, do you think that the local students going out has rebounded the same way? No, look, I think that's taking time, sort of reflecting on that that we've probably got some more work to do to kickstart and also just different times, different pressures. So, I mean, cost of living is becoming really challenging. We know that more and more of our students are working part-time in order to be able to keep a roof over their heads while they, while they study. And so the capacity to actually take what we would have enjoyed six months or a year to spend overseas, I think that is becoming more challenging. We And we saw this before the pandemic, of course, and, and you guys know better than, than anyone, that those sort of shorter connected to discipline or internship types of offerings are really attractive to students. And it's sort of working then with our academic staff to redevelop those sort of short mobility projects and continuing to reinforce with students the value of those to, to see that sort of movement go so out as well. I think that that is slower to recover, but just because of sort of the complexity of the, the economic environment that we're in at the moment and students not necessarily wanting to give up their part-time jobs or concerned about that. So, but it is an absolute focus. You know, we're really, really keen to look at, again, how do we work with our academics around really exciting discipline-based international experience with our partners. We know that our partners really want the students back and are eager to be able to see the movement in both directions. So it is absolutely a priority. Interestingly, we've also, I think, seen our industry partners really engaging um, with the international experiences more. So University of Adelaide, we've launched a fantastic program with Deloitte. It's the Academy by Deloitte here with us. And as part of that program, uh, so students come in and they can study across a wide range of discipline areas. But in addition to their studies, they get access to paid internships and and mentoring and network programs with Deloitte and, and additional professional certificate studies. But through our conversations with Deloitte, they're really keen to be able to attract international students into the program because they want to not only build their um, workforce here in South Australia, they're really keen to look at the talent that can go back into the region that can be advocates and ambassadors for them. And so then also looking at how we might find opportunities for Australian students to have work experiences or engage in internships with Deloitte offices in the Asia Pacific. So, and that's just one example. I've had um, quite a few conversations lately with industry partners who are keen to see as part of their talent attraction, retention and development opportunities for our students to spend time 
um, in another location and connect with their operations in, in that other location. So I'm quite excited by that because I know that, again, uh, and you guys have been involved in this space for so long, but one of the something that we've you know always had to try and reinforce is the value of global mobility experiences for employability and, and that industry partners can see what they're by having the students go out and do that, how rich then their experiences are for the organisations that they then choose to work with. Wonderful model, you know, the, the the collaboration with Deloitte. Do you feel that's going to become an increasingly important part of higher ed into the future? Yeah, look, I really do. What's so great about the conversation with Deloitte, and and like I said, we've, we'll be having similar conversations with other industry partners, is that they understand that you can't you can't just show up at the end and expect you're going to get, you know, a, a job ready graduate. That being involved earlier on and being part of that educational experience and, and working with our academics to shape the curriculum and to look at sort of what's happening in the lecture theatre and then sort of looking at direct opportunities for kind of applied engagement with that learning in, in their workforces. I think that we're going to have more well-rounded students and I think that the employers will get better employees because they've, they've been part of that journey. And so I, I'm really excited by the fact that we're having these great conversations with industry partners about them getting involved earlier on because often the rhetoric was is like, oh, the universities aren't, they're not, the students aren't getting the skills that they need, they're not getting the experience that they need. Well, it's not, we've got to be in this together. We've got to partner, we've got to do it together in order to get the best outcome. And we know that talent and attracting talent is going to be an issue for this country, <laughs> hopefully for the foreseeable future, because, you know, we, we really want great outcomes for, for our graduates. But I think the closer that we work together, the better it is for our for student success. Because you were mentioning thinking about the future and trying to have students ready and trying to adapt. I was just thinking about the, the current talk around AI and the pl place that it's taking. And I was wondering how you see that Um, impact, impacting the university and the students' experience and how you think that's going to evolve in, in the coming years because it's such a big topic at the moment and yet there's so much that we're still trying to wrap our head around in terms of how that's going to... We can't deny that it's there. We can't deny that it's going to take more and more place, but how do, how do the universities make it work? It's a great question. I, I'm not sure that I am the most the best person to respond to it. I think that this is entertaining a lot of time and thought from uh, my colleague, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic and people that are in our teaching and learning and, and student experience space. I, I think ChatGPT has um, created yet another um, impetus for us to look at what we do and how we do it. I don't think AI is going away. I think we need to, we need to embrace it. We need to work with our students to learn how to best use it and how we can we can take advantage of it to actually help to enhance the, the teaching and learning experience. So I, what I really like is how some of our academics are actually using, for example, chat GPT to write an essay and then having students actually having to interrogate and actually find out well, where are the flaws and, and, and what's the issue. I also think that it means that we will approach our assessment differently. And so rather than just penning an assignment, you actually have to deliver a presentation or you have to defend your piece of work. And, and so, and those are really important skills, right, to be able to actually justify your argument and understand your argument and unpack it and have people query that. So that's where I think that there's, there's lots that we can do with it. But the technology is just going to get smarter and smarter and smarter. And so it's not, we can't sort of put our hands up and say, oh, well, we just won't engage with it. We know that that's not an option. The, the key for us is to really, how do we, how do we leverage the digital environment to ensure that we're preparing students and as future graduates to be able to use all of the tools at their disposal to navigate these sort of future industries and ever changing roles that they might have. But You know, it's again, it's probably a full other podcast in itself, but a really, a really interesting topic, and something that, yeah, with with the international, we had a, a call. So the University of Adelaide is a member of APRU, which is the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, and there was a call uh, yesterday that involved probably at ten, ten universities from all around the globe that was sort of looking at 
um, sort of the future of education and education in a digital world. And it's really interesting to hear how different universities are approaching it, but also where there's the opportunity to share and learn from one another. So again, one of the amazing positives of international education is, is that you get to tap into this global pool of expertise and resource and then look at what models might work well for your particular cohorts or in your particular environment. So, yeah, that's quite good fun. What was your first job in international? My first job in international was probably when I, so at the University of Queensland, I moved over to be what was essentially the director of the student experience office. It was called the UQ Advantage office at the time, but it we had responsibility for outbound student exchange. And so that was probably my first sort of toe into the international education landscape. And I always say to people that everybody loves student exchange. It was the happiest part of international. You're not, you're not necessarily having to you know, monitor the numbers around every international student that you've got coming through the door from a revenue perspective or some of the pressures that come around meeting targets, load targets, etc. Everyone loves exchange because everybody, well, certainly the majority of people within universities can see the value and you're not competing. I mean, it's just, it's all about how do we get more students out into the world? How do we get more into Australia? So it was it was definitely a really fun part of the international education um, portfolio t- to be able to, to lead and to support. One of the things I love about that UQ model is how, yeah, the outbound mobility stuff was brought really close to other other parts of the student experience, like student student yeah. advancement, right? So leadership programs, volunteering, internships, all the career stuff. I think that was such a, a visionary model. A few unis kind of do that, but nowhere near as well as that model was established in, in my view. And, you know, sort of linking it back to the AI stuff, really the role of universities is going to change quite a bit with, you know, with just, just in terms of straight up teaching and learning, one of the ways I think unis can ring fence themselves from some of the negative sides of that change are looking at the other value that they provide to to students when they're on campus. So volunteering internships, leadership, mobility, et cetera. Yeah. And that a lot of that stuff falls under your portfolio right now, doesn't it? Yeah, so some of it does. And I guess I think that I'm fortunate that I get to work with, so as I said, my my colleagues in the academic and student engagement space to help develop the partnerships that provide these opportunities for students. You're right that as universities are defining themselves, we've got these amazing campuses and and amazing infrastructure. How do we, if there is a push to have more online or to have sort of hybrid learning options, what do we do with our campuses? And, And as much of that is about creating communities and creating opportunities for students to come together around shared problems or shared interests and so I do think that there will continue to be an emphasis and my hope investment around really looking at the student experience because we know we know that it's more than just what they receive as part of their the lecture environments. The university experiences is about the people you meet and the experiences that you have both in and outside the classroom and that opportunity to develop a new interest and to, to get out and explore new geographies and new sectors and and I think that's why you know, universities are such interesting places to work because I think we do, this is going to sound super cheesy, but we do change lives. And I think we change lives because of exposure to, to, to the new and to the different and that, and that safe way of being able to sort of push yourself to, to try new things. Besides changing lives, and I, and I agree, I can relate to that, but what do you most enjoy at the moment about your job like what is what is it that in terms of things that you get to do that you take most uh, pleasure out of I have a really great job I this was a new portfolio so when I moved to the University of Adelaide the division didn't exist so I've over the past 18 plus months have had the privilege of being able to really build the new division so bringing in teams that had sat in other parts of of the university and looking at the synergies that exist across all of those functions. So in the past, for example, our alumni relations and our advancement area didn't do as much with our international, so our global engagement in our future students area. By bringing those teams together now, uh, we see that there's great opportunities to connect more with our international alumni to support partnership work or to support recruitment efforts. 
So I really love that opportunity to be able to identify the the intersects, the synergies and where the crossovers are and to really leverage and exploit those to be able to do new things and to provide new opportunities for staff and students. I love that I have again, the privilege and the capacity to be able to promote the university offshore. So it's, it's, it is a real joy to be able to go and talk to colleagues in India and in China and Vietnam or in the US or the UK about how our institutions can come together to deliver joint research or joint education offerings that, can, that will deliver greater impact than our individual universities alone. And not not many people get to do that. And so you get to meet all of these really incredible people that are doing mind-blowing things and then look at how we can bring a part of that back to support the the great things that are happening um, in our city, our state and our nation. So, yeah, there's not much that I don't love about my job. some, every day looks very different. Um, my workload sometimes is a bit insane, um, but sort of when you overlay that, just the enormous joy that comes from being able to establish new partnerships and know that the work that you're doing is going to make a difference. I think that that is that that that's sort of what gets me out of bed every day. You say your workload is insane, but I got to say, like you're you're somebody who is lightning fast on email. Like given the breadth of your, I know how busy you, you must be. But I'm always stunned by how fast you you reply to people. What's your secret? You must have some like time management, you know, ninja skills up your up up your sleeve. So share them. (laughs) I need to know. I'm just really obsessive compulsive about email. So, well, partly because relationships really matter. So if somebody writes to me and they they need something, then I then I try to respond quickly because usually there's there's a reason that they've got in touch and. And so I definitely do my best to try to, to get back to people as quickly as I can because I don't want to be the reason that things are stalled or sort of blocked. I have a rule for myself that I don't go to sleep at night until I can see the bottom of my inbox. So, And I file everything. So, you know, I keep track of all of my, my emails. And so I, I always kind of I kind of complex but sort of works for me filing system where I can always find something. But... I think it's one of those things, Robin, you'd know this, but when you love what you do, I mean, everybody gets cranky every now and again around sort of the workloads and there are days where I, I wish that I you know, um, had a few spare hours. Um, but when you love what you do, it, 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 is, it is fun. And I mean, it's, you know, getting to spend an hour chatting to you guys. I mean, this is really fun. You know, we get to get to reflect on the things that we enjoy about our sector and, and the work that we do. And so... Yeah, that's if you didn't respond quickly, then maybe you wouldn't be invited. So um, I always say yes. I'm a, I'm a big and my my team in my office gets cranky because I, I am a big yes woman. I really like trying new things and putting myself out there. So that does probably add to the craziness of my schedule sometimes. But you only live once, right? Do you have any example of something that you've said yes to that you feel like you wouldn't have had a chance to do if you have just gone out on a limb and said yes? Like I'm just thinking about opportunities that people might just pass out on because they're too busy or a bit afraid yeah. and there's so many great things I think that have come my way because so what the thing that jumps to mind is so I'm on the board of this incredible not-for-profit called Kokoda Track Foundation and Kokoda Track Foundation or KTF is really focused on improving lives prosperity of people of Papua New Guinea And it came about because in 2019, again, I was with the University of Queensland at that time, but we had our first senior executive mission to to Papua New Guinea. And it just was an incredible eye-opener for me. So the fact that, so PNG, from the tip of Australia to PNG, it's like it's an, a tiny, tiny, I'm, I'm going to, I think it's like 20 kilometres. It's nothing. It might even be shorter than that. But the level of poverty that people live with in PNG is just appalling in every sense of the word. So education, infrastructure, health, the poverty is just so profound. And, and I was quite taken aback by that, that a country that is so close to our own and had had such a deep connection with Australia for such a long period of time, could you could have such unbelievable gender-based violence. You could have women still dying at unbelievable rates during childbirth that 
people couldn't access education because there was no electricity, that there was no roads that connected villages in some of the more remote parts of the country. And so I kind of went away from that experience and having connected with university colleagues and and embassy colleagues and and others in in PNG thinking what what can I do and I was very fortunate at the time to have met the the chair of KTF and the CEO as part of this work with that we'd done in PNG and so I with with no expectation when I got back to Brisbane I said if there's anything that I could ever do to support what you're doing please let me know I mean we I was fortunate that I worked with our international development team at the time UQID absolutely phenomenal what the work that they do and I thought that there could be some opportunities to connect programs but then the chair actually asked me if I'd be interested in getting involved in one of their program committees and so yeah I jumped at the opportunity and then after spending some time working with that program committee they asked me to join the board and and it is it is amazing I there are times where I feel like I wish I had more time to give to it so it is that balancing act but it's, it's, it is such a privilege to be able to work with organisations that are making such an incredible difference, uh, and they really do. I mean, it is the, the education programs and, and providing different ways for students to learn, connecting with teachers over there, looking at health programs, really tackling gender-based violence and gender inequality head on. And so, yeah, if I, if, I hadn't, if I hadn't sort of leaned into that, I wouldn't have that opportunity to, to be part and to be inspired every day by that organisation. So, yeah, I do think that sometimes you can easily say, oh, look, my days are so busy. And it is, you know, you, it is a balancing act. I think that I, I, I definitely think you can't spread yourself too thinly because then you can't do anything well. And so it is about making sure you can sort of judge the sort of time and expectation. But sometimes if you think you can, you can stretch a little bit and give it a go. It's definitely, it's definitely worth it. When you do have to say no, how do you mm, do that? Poorly. <laughs> because it's hard, right? Like, you know, I guess particularly once you reach your sort of level where, you know, every time you open an email, I mean, so some emails are going to con- probably contain quite, quite some heavy stuff. But, you know, th- there must be heaps of interesting opportunities coming your way. Yeah. And There's- some stuff you probably have to say no to right there's definitely lots more that I would like to do than I can do and so again my office team is always laughing at me because I will send them an email saying can I do this and they will come back to show me the diary for the day and say no you can't so what I found then though is is provide opportunities for other people so if there's something that excites me then there's a good chance that it will excite somebody else in my team and so then providing that opportunity for them to engage with it so whether it's an event or whether it's an opportunity to represent at a particular forum so then I try to look at who in my team would also enjoy and benefit from the opportunity and then ask them or or get in touch and say can I send a nominated sort of representative and and sort of looking that way and that is the fun thing of sort of reflecting on this as you kind of move through your career that when you're sort of starting out you're so excited to be invited to any event do you remember you know where you kind of oh this is so exciting I'm going to meet all these new people and but as you kind of move through, your schedule makes that more difficult. And sometimes when you've had four events of an evening in a week, you're kind of like, oh, do I really want to do another event? Whereas somebody who might be starting out has that same joy of being able to kind of get out there and sort of experience and, and you. So I try to balance that because I think that you've got to provide opportunities for the, the teams to continue to grow and build their careers as well. So that's where I if I have to say no, then it's, I, I always find it, the comfort of that is always because that means somebody else gets to say yes, and that's great. So we definitely need to do more of that. One of the, one of the superpowers I, I think you have, I mean, this I'm observing, you know, from, from afar, so to speak, but you, you seem to have this superpower as like an integrator. You talked a lot about synergy before. And I mean, I've seen, you know, you work at UQ, now Uni of Adelaide, working across areas like entrepreneurship, communications, corporate, alumni. The, these are very different areas of universities and you're you do this amazing job of bringing them together. What's the secret to that? I mean, really tactically, how can people get better at finding those opportunities across different areas and connecting them together? Yeah, look, it, it's, I think that it is a real, 
kind of keeping an open mind to things. So one of the privileges that you have when when you get to sort of sit on top of, I guess, an umbrella of activities is that you have the benefit of sort of seeing the priority and activities across each of those branches. And so you can then sort of say, hang on a second, future students might be talking about this, but actually advancement's talking about the same thing. They're just not using the same language and they haven't necessarily thought to kind of plug it in. And so what's great is creating executive teams that come around the table and then talk about what they're doing and what their priorities are, but providing enough time as part of our planning work to look at what the connections are. So you actually, as part of our kind of operational planning or our annual planning, what we do is we really look at as part of what quite focused around what are the links to other teams? What are the opportunities? What's what, what, who are you going to need to work with in order to ensure that that's success? So being really conscious about trying to find links and also so much of what we do in external engagement, no one team can really deliver anything without connecting with other branches within our own division, but also with others. And so we've constructed ourselves in terms of the structure of, of the division to enable that. So you do need to connect with the comms team that sits in a different branch, but that will be pivotal to your success. Or you've got to make sure you've got to talk to protocol or global engagement if you've got an international visit because they're going to be able to wrap them around you and and provide support so I do think you have to be quite intentional about it so you've got to look at it on your in terms of your day-to-day or your weekly meetings look at how you do it as part of your um, sort of planning work and sort of the broad strategy but also celebrate that so where you've got teams that have come together um, and collectively have done something that is you know delivering fantastic outcomes celebrate the fact that it was a joint activity across multiple teams uh, and I think then people were quite excited about where there's an opportunity then to to get involved and to engage with another group um, and find out more so I do think that that's the other thing is finding opportunities to share so as part of the work we do when we come together as division there's often an opportunity for sort of one team to share what they're doing with another team that an opportunity to ask questions and learn from one another because we're always learning right and if you can create that sort of um, work environment where people can try new things and gain new experiences but also join and celebrating other people's success I think people are more motivated and excited about the work that they do again not always easy because particularly at the moment, you know, we've got people that are pretty stretched. Everyone's working really hard. Financial environments are tough at universities. So you've got to try and find different things that will work for different teams. And that's not a one size fits all. But I do think most teams really enjoy the opportunity to come together and learn from one another. So as part of our, for example, within our leadership group, we have quarterly sort of planning and debrief sessions. And at the last one, we had a leadership share And so the individual branch heads came and sort of talked about one of the things we were focused on was sort of process improvement and prioritisation. And so they came and talked about things that were working in their areas and almost all of them connected with another part of the division. So they had enabled a process improvement or they had been able to innovate around priorities because they'd worked with a different part of the division. And so that that was fantastic to see. And I think they really enjoyed it as well. Do you have a really actionable example that you could share there like was there one that came up around process improvement and prioritization that just made you go wow genius there's probably quite a few i mean some of them i mean they're really kind of practical things but part of it was so in our advancement areas we had quite a clunky process for sending out communications and so knowing that we need to streamline that we brought in um, our corporate communications team that sort of looked at the end-to-end process and removed a number of steps without actually stepping away from the quality uh, and timeliness of how they could deliver. We've implemented a whole new process around events. So we had a situation where people would come in for event support and there might be somebody, a different team that had that expertise, but instead of connecting that within our team, we were just saying to somebody else, oh, go around, go, go find them. And that just frustrates people when you bounced around. So looking at, so we put a, a new process in place to sort of gather all the information around an event at once. And now there is a team that is comprised of members across multiple different areas that come together and assess that event. And then they divvy up the work and know exactly what needs to be done. But for the person who's come in for that support, it's seamless. It's just a kind of a flow through. So there's lots of different things like that. And and most of it is about understanding 
what are the pain points and how to collectively we come up with a solution. So it's not pointing the finger and saying, oh, you're doing that wrong or that's yours to fix. It's how, how do we do this collectively? How do we understand the issue and come together as a team to identify what could be a solution? And you never get this the right solution the first time around. It's always, you know, there's always things that need to be tweaked. But I think, again, it's that sort of willingness to iterate and innovate and ask questions and know that we're not perfect and sort of continue to fix things as we go along. So I think that's really important for the, yeah, for our workforce, for our workplace culture. The, the comment I was going to make about that is it sounds a, a lot of that process is around remo- removing friction. I, I've just read this brilliant book called The Human Element, which talks about, you know, so much of what we do in work is about fuel, like marketing more and getting your message out more and pushing to persuade people. And in fact, to make things more effective or to, to you know, make more sales or get people to engage with you more, often we just need to make it easier. We just need to remove those friction points. And there are so many great actionable things that you can do as long as you're paying attention to that side of the equation. So it sounds like you guys are doing a really good job in that. I think removing barriers for people. So make it, getting people, getting to know people is a big thing. So the more that you invest in kind of opportunities for teams to come together and, and actually talk to one another and understand capabilities and interests and, and challenges, the, I think the better outcomes that you get. The Also, the other thing is, is that you don't have to own it or control it to make an impact. And so what I really enjoy is where you've got the opportunity to advocate for a group and to, to get engaged with an activity, but it doesn't necessarily have to be yours. So we talked about the entrepreneurship activity. So at, in, at University of Queensland, that was part directly under sort of my remit. Here um, at the University of Adelaide, it's not, but that hasn't stopped me from connecting to it. In fact, quite the opposite is if they need a champion or cheerleader, like I'm right there, right? And it's annoyingly so. And so what that's been great because they've been prepared to kind of let me hang out with them. But but I think that then they've also enjoyed having somebody who's kind of in their corner and sort of championing. And so because of that, we've been able to implement some really cool things here at the University of Adelaide. So we introduced uh, our chief student entrepreneur who was an amazing chap last year and now we've just announced our second one and I think she's going to be amazing. Just last week we launched Think Hers, which is a fantastic new program that's been designed by women students for women students to really start to address the gaps in the entrepreneurial ecosystem for female founders and female leaders. And so I do think it's one of those things that just if you've got an opportunity to help out or to to get involved with something, again, it's like I said, I'm not very good at saying no, but this is the great stuff, right? You don't, you don't have to own it. You don't have to control it. You don't have to be the one who calls all the shots. If there are ways to actually just get behind and, and if something that you really believe in, just, just get in and back it and you'll find ways to hopefully add value. Otherwise, you'll just irritate them, but that's fine too. <laughs> I've got a question for you because you talk about the importance of getting to know people, of grabbing opportunities when they present themselves and, you know, attending events. What advice would you give to someone that might not have a lot of experience at it, might put their hands up to go to a few events, but might feel very self-conscious about attending, not quite know how to go and meet people, how to start a conversation? What would you tell them to help them get more comfortable and, and Take that first step. I, I think the advice is, is that in my experience, there are very few people who actually like networking. There, there are very few people who can put themselves out there without any kind of self-doubt or feeling a little bit self-conscious about what they're doing. You've just, you've got to push past it. I don't, I don't love networking. I think people think that I do because I have to do it so often in my job that I think that they assume but I always feel awkward, you know, and I mean, moving to a new city was really out of my comfort zone. I didn't have my professional network. I, I really had to start from scratch. So again, when I was invited, I accepted because I knew that I needed to build a new network in order to be able to be effective in my role. And so it is about putting yourself out there. There's lots of, I mean, lots and lots of things you can read and advice around that about just kind of setting yourself a number. So I've got to meet three new people and actually just doing that. And once you've done that, then you go, okay, I've done that. And then you can kind of just go and hide in the corner if you wish. So I think there's something about sort of setting a goal for yourself 
and then actually delivering on that. The other thing is, is that understanding that everybody feels the same way. And so going out and just introducing yourself and, and sort of trying to identify if you've got something in common or something that, you know, might be a shared interest. Nobody's, everybody, every, everybody will be, I think, willing to have a conversation. I mean, that's my experience with it. And if they're not, then you just go to the next person. But it, it, it's much about just kind of backing yourself to, to go into a, a, a new environment and trusting that there's a reason that you're there. And you're just as valuable as anybody else in that room for that particular event and context and, and having some fun with it. That's that's my advice. And and don't drink too much because I think that if you, if you enjoy too many beverages, the, the conversation might not necessarily move in the direction that you wish. One of the things I've always loved about you, and I think it really comes across as we're having this conversation, is you are so positive and you've got this wonderful energy. Where, where does that come from? I don't know, that makes me laugh. That's a really nice thing to say. Thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. But it's not just me. Like, I think anyone that's met you would say the same thing, honestly. like I am an optimist. I, I think that largely I look at the glass half full and mostly because like, I genuinely, I'm, genuinely believe that I'm in such a privileged position. I'm so grateful to do the work that I do. And so that when you sort of come with it from that, that every day is different. Every day... I get to, yeah, so I might start the day with a, a, a call to, to, the, to the US or in, I might do the middle of the day in Southeast Asia and at the end of the day I'm connecting with Europe or I, I might get to meet with some of our alumni or I get to have an opportunity to meet with industry partners to look at a, a new program or, or a new opportunity. I get to be involved in strategy for a university that is – is massive in terms of it's it's the opportunities that it provides for students and, and the research activity that we do. So it's hard not to smile because you get to do all of that. And it's one of those things where it's like always pinch me because I can't believe that this is my life. I can't believe that this is my job. Sometimes I think I shouldn't tell anybody too much about it because everybody will want it because it really is the best job in the world, but that's okay. If we get more people into higher ed and international education, that's always a good thing too. But I just... I think you get out what you put in and so you can choose to kind of see the negative or you can choose to find the positive. And, of course, there's always days where we go, oh, my goodness, you know, what's happening? But it's overarchingly the days are full filled with positive things and so I think you just you t- just lean into that and, and it is about having a sense of gratitude and a sense that nobody owes me anything you know I I do it for myself and and what I achieve is because of the effort that I put into it and so I'm damn well going to give it a hundred percent because that's what I expect of myself and and I have a lot of fun doing it along the way so I guess that seems like a big ramble now but I think that's probably if if there's a smile on my face that's the reason. Jessica Gallagher thanks for joining us on Global Horizons. Thank you both so much it's been a fantastic afternoon appreciate it. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney, and we pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.